You're watching Bread and Roses, a weekly political social magazine that's broadcast by New Channel TV in English and Persian. Hi everyone, I'm Mariam Namazi. And I'm Fari Bospuya. In this week's program, we'll be discussing blasphemy law. We'll interview Bob Churchill of International Humanist and Ethical Union on this issue. In shocking news of the week, we'll be discussing the attack on a museum in Tunisia, as well as the attack in Tunisia against women LGBT. In the insane fatwa of the week, this time it's from Indonesia, and a fatwa to murder gay and lesbian people there. A good news of the week, it's from Afghanistan, where people from there started a campaign, Justice for Farhonde, a young woman who was killed and burned to death by the Islamist. Stay with us. Blasphemy laws give respectability to violence against people and women. Islamists and the religious right in particular have placed a false moral equivalency between hurt sensibilities and human lives where none exist. The world would be a much better place without blasphemy laws. When we're discussing the issue of blasphemy laws, it's interesting how there is this false moral equivalency. You have someone burning a Quran, you have someone who writes a book about Islam, and immediately we're told that they've offended some sensibilities and therefore it gives the impression that their attack was justified uh, because it, it's as if, you know, you being hurt is the same as you going and killing somebody. Yeah. And the reality is these are not one and the same. If you're, if you're offended, shut the book, turn away, go somewhere else. You cannot kill, hurt, imprison, maim people because of it. As in, the, the interesting point about blasphemy law it's, is, is a continuous uh, issue. Uh, eating food at certain times, um, laughing, uh, wearing bright colour sort of clothes. There's so minute, even minutest details, it seems that offends certain people and they use that to control people. So there's two aspects to this. One is actually means of control of society. The other thing is that about people stopping people questioning anything and I think that that's the crux for me that's why when we um, are facing blasphemy law you could immediately see they're trying to control people and shut down any criticism and critical thinking. And in a sense it's exactly the case where you have the Islamic scholar who's an Islamist Qaradawi you know he had said something about how if you stop uh, if you allow people to leave Islam, for example, become apostates, if you allow them to blaspheme, you're not going to have Islam, any, any more religion left. And that's the point. They're trying to stop people from questioning, from criticizing. And the way they do that is because you can't stop people's free thinking and their questioning, you know, using the most violent means in order to try to shut down this sort of discussion and debate. So what do we need to, what do, we need to do about this? I think Got that's it. a key issue. Yeah, I mean, I think... We've got to work towards ending blasphemy laws everywhere and anywhere. And the fact of the matter is we've got to stop excusing, you know, um, their justifications for their violence. I mean, very often when you look at the sort of response to an attack on Charlie or Avi Jatro in Bangladesh or the woman Farhonde in Afghanistan, the response even from people who are considered progressive is, well, she knew she was going to offend. Why did she do it? And, you know, it's like saying that the woman who got raped deserved to be raped. If only she hadn't worn such a short skirt. If only she hadn't been out so late. You know, it's blaming the victim and that has to stop if we're going to get anywhere. And I think there's an element of tolerance and people, um, and particularly religious people, learning uh, the uh, the issue of tolerance they need to be tolerant of people being critical of the views and uh, and the uh, you know uh, the philosophy or the way of life they want to impose so th this is quite important link with tolerance and uh, providing a space for people to be free thinking and being able to criticize everything there's no limits everything and i think that's quite important so it's there's a link between uh, blasph blasphemy law and shutting down critical thinking and also I think there's element of tolerance as well. Yeah definitely I mean I think blasphemy is a, a dirty word in a sense if someone's accused of causing blasphemy but I think it was Ina Shevchenko from Femen who had recently said that we need to celebrate blasphemy because it is an important mm -hmm. challenge to religion and to the gatekeepers of power that are telling us what we can and cannot say. So until they kill and hurt people for blasphemy, we must celebrate blasphemy and shout it from every rooftop.
Bob Churchill, welcome to our program. Thank you very much. I wanted to ask you about the campaign to end blasphemy laws. Why is that important? Uh, well, it's important, I think, especially at the moment, because we've seen uh, such a, a period of, of, of sort of tragedy uh, uh, in the last few months after Paris and Copenhagen, um, but also because we've seen a really bad reaction to that. And I think part of the reason that we, we brought forward plans to uh, have this sort of uh, global campaign called End Blasphemy Laws uh, run by a, an international coalition of groups that are all that have all been campaigning on blasphemy laws for a long time um, but part of the reason that we brought forward the plans to have this campaign uh, wasn't just because of the events that we saw in Paris and Copenhagen but because uh, of the reaction to them uh, that so much of the sort of media and comment afterwards was uh, either borderline apologist uh, for the for the for the terrorists uh, or uh, mollycoddled and and made excuses for limitations on freedom of expression. So I think that was that was all, in a sense that's almost as alarming as the the terror attacks themselves. I mean, what, how does this help? In a sense, do you think these sort of uh, excuses and justifications help to keep blasphemy laws in place? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that. Um, Whenever, whenever there's, whenever you've you've got a law in place and someone's trying to bring it down, if there is someone excusing and apologising for it, uh, or as we see a lot, I mean, part of the reason that this is so international and that we're trying to look at blasphemy laws and laws against insult to religion and so on as as one legal issue, is because we've seen that laws in one place will be used as a sort of rationalisation uh, to keep laws in another place, that when people like the Pope say, you know, it's excusable to hit someone if they insult your deeply held beliefs, if they insult your mother and so on, uh, or if you have people say, oh yes, it's terrible, but I didn't like some of the cartoons, or I didn't like this, I didn't like that, uh, then of course that, that lends a sort of false legitimacy to people who say, it's necessary or we have the right to curtail free expression on, on religion or on any other issue that, that I, I hold personally uh, very dear. So it is about trying to break down the, uh, sort of, the sort of weird mutual dependency that exists internationally that sort of supports uh, these laws. Um, and I think what's, what's really sort of sad about it is that um, so many of the sort of c commenting uh, class and so many people uh, did sort of hedge their bets on whether it was good or bad that that that, that Charlie Hebdo was uh, uh, attacked, and yet the the sort of broader human rights international consensus, again something that our campaign is trying to convey, is is now quite solidly against the existence of blasphemy laws, um, and I think that's something that because there's been so much equivocation, people have sort of lost sight of a bit. Actually, the EU, through the EU Guidelines on Freedom of Religion or Belief, the United Nations Human Rights Council, when it's doing its job properly, uh, the UN in general, uh, the General Assembly, have all moved away from the idea that there's any legitimacy to defamation of religion laws or blasphemy laws, uh, and the Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Religion or Belief is very, very clear. There should be no blasphemy laws, they should be ended. Uh, the EU says you have the right to ridicule belief, it's very good, it's very clear, it says if you, uh, the, the idea that if you speak and someone is, may react violently to that, there is a very clear distinction between that and incitement to violence, they are different things. Um, so uh, the actual international human rights consensus uh, is, is fairly solid and that's part of what our international coalition against blasphemy laws is trying to, to show and convey that there is this worldwide um, agreement amongst human rights NGOs and human rights experts uh, that we need the right to blaspheme, we need the right to criticise uh, religion uh, and that it already is there, it already exists and can be supported by existing uh, treaties and the existing international human rights framework. Why do we still have so many blasphemy laws? Um, I think it's, it's a number of reasons um, but they're obviously very often interlinked with uh, and, and used the most when there is a sort of regime that uses them uh, to prosecute people who, who, in addition to talking about religion in some way, are also talking about a political regime. So, for example, uh, Raif Badawi, there, there is a very sort of clear correlation that he is targeted partly because he's saying there should be more freedom of religion, freedom of belief. Uh, but also he was specifically talking about and criticising the, the interaction between uh, state and mosque, between the, the 
religious authorities. Uh, and I think very often we see that when there are freedom of religion or belief violations or freedom of expression violations against uh, uh, non-religious persons, secular persons or people criticising religion, they have often also made some sort of uh, political uh, gesture or statement. So partly they're kept in place because they're a useful tool of power. Um, but we also see this other side of things where they actually become nothing but um, a, tr uh, a trouble really to the authorities. So in Pakistan I would say the story is a bit different. They're probably the many in the political class will, will now recognize that these laws are a liability, they're causing problems, they bring negative attention internationally, they create mob violence, difficult situations for the police and so on. I'm, I'm quite convinced that there will be many in the political class in Pakistan that would, if they could, get rid of them. Uh, but they're unable to say that, they're unable to even breach the topic because the people that have done that, like Salman Tazir, get killed. Um, uh, the judge that sentenced Mumtaz Kadri, the assassin of Salman Tazir originally, had to flee the country. So we're talking about people having to go into exile, risking their lives, potentially getting murdered. Um, so, so yeah, it's this twin thing that in some countries it's, it's a tool of the political establishment, in other countries it's that uh, there is so much uh, highly uh, violent uh, threat behind the supporters of blasphemy laws, uh, who are doing it just purely because they think that there should be blasphemy laws and there shouldn't be blasphemy and so on, uh, that it's impossible to actually bring them down and change them and reform them. How prevalent are blasphemy laws? Um, very. So we, uh, part, the End Blasphemy Laws campaign, uh, which is being run by a coalition of, of international and, and national uh, groups, um, uh, has sort of uh, taken a lot of its data from the IHEU Freedom of Thought report, um, which, uh, so I'm the editor of the IHU Freedom Thought Report, I work at the International Humanist and Ethical Union, and um, we found that there are about 70 countries in the world, and actually we've, we've got a few more to add in where there were kind of cases that we, we didn't quite consider, or uh, laws that, that weren't included in the uh, report but are important for the blasphemy laws. Um, and yeah, there are about 70 countries that have some form of blasphemy law and I think it's very important to note that the number differs depending on who you ask uh, and we've tried to be um, uh, inclusive of any law that, that can be or is used to uh, prevent criticism, satire or ridicule of religion. So we include laws against insult to religion or insult to religious sensibilities and so on. Um, we do not include uh, incitement to hatred or incitement to violence laws unless, as in some cases, they are used to suppress criticism of religion as well. A final question is why, why is there a need to end blasphemy laws? Uh, well, th the victims of blasphemy laws are the people who are accused of blasphemy. Uh, we've seen it time and time again. Uh, it, it's, it's people like Fakunda last week in, in, in uh, Afghanistan, murdered in the streets. Uh, for no no reason, one of these spurious, malicious accusations of burning the Quran, which is never never verified, just just a, a way of attacking someone. Uh, often women, often vulnerable people, when a when a crowd of men decide they want to get uh, violent. Um, so people like that are victimised, picked off individually, or because they're part of a minority, because they're Baha'i or Ahmadi or Christian, or, or and so on. Um, but also because um, they're linked to this political. Uh, uh, suppression as well. So very often the people who are pinned down by, by blasphemy and insult to religion laws uh, are people like Raif Badawi but also his lawyer Walid Abu Alker where there is there's someone who's standing up for human rights and someone who's saying that we should be free to talk about religion and to have whatever religion or belief we want. So the people who are being pinned down are the people who, who bring the prospect of change not just on freedom of expression issues but on wider issues as well. Um, so ending blasphemy laws is about protecting innocent victims and enabling people to speak about human rights, about secularism, about their democracy in a, in a wider context as well. Thank you very much. Thank you.
I hope you enjoyed that interview. It's an important campaign to defend, to end blasphemy laws everywhere. I think it will make the world a much safer place for people. And I think that's part and parcel of uh, progressive secularists and atheists actually being on an offensive now. It's our time to say, look, end blasphemy law. Uh, blasphemy laws are reactionary, they are inhumane, they are trying to stop free thinking and that's it's important for people I, mean, I think we've said this many times on, on this program for people to survive a daily life you know we need to be able to criticize we need to be able to question and that's very closely linked to blasphemy so blasphemy laws that prevent any criticism must end and it must be you know everywhere and there shouldn't be any country or any anywhere that criticism of religion or you know any um, sacred text or idea or non go area. Yeah, exactly. I mean, one of the things too is that it's also something that affects a lot of people who are religious. You have uh, people who are, let's say, Christian minorities in Pakistan who are facing blasphemy mm. charges and Muslims who've questioned or said things differently than the different uh, versions of Islam. Giving different versions, yeah, like uh, Baha'is are considered heretics, the Ahmadiyyas are considered heretics. And, you know, whether they're religious minorities or whether there are Muslims who think differently. And I think this is very much linked uh, to uh, uh, where there are movements to improve a lot. We've seen, for example, in Iran, a lot of the trade unionists uh, um, been arrested. And part of the charges is blasphemy and uh, um, criticizing the sacred um, structure within the existing society. It's very much linked to uh, a protest movement and social movements that exist. When we are talking about the issue of blasphemy, yes, definitely we have to end blasphemy laws everywhere, but I think it's also really important to see blasphemy laws within a larger context of the role of religion in the state and public space. And it's something that it's not enough just to be opposed to blasphemy laws or apostasy laws. We have to be opposed to Sharia laws, to any manifestation of religion in the state and in power, which is used to manipulate, to control, to restrict and deny people their rights and freedoms. Shocking news of the week is from Tunisia. We've all heard reports of the horrendous attack on a museum there. There's also been reports of Islamist attacks against LGBT women. And again, it's what, you know, the Islamists versus just ordinary people going about their lives, trying to live as they want. They just will never allow it. And it's important to stand up to them. And I think the important thing is that Tunisia, it's an important country. There is a huge fight between the secularists uh, and progressive people of Tunisia and the Islamists. And what do you do? They're picking on a section of a society that they think they can win. And that's why they've attacked, uh, um, you know, hom homosexuals now in, and they've killed them because they think they have an element of support within the wider interest. So that's why it's important that we need to condemn this and, uh, you know, support the secularists and progressive people in Tunisia who are fighting the Islamists and is a strong movement there. Yeah, I mean, exactly. This is, I think this is the point exactly, is that because there is a fight back that exists, very often you do see this sort of violence as a way of pushing that back and scaring people, intimidating them, terrorizing them. Uh, you know, and if you look at the LGBT uh, women who were attacked, you've got uh, an organization called Shuf uh, who has said that they're, you know, they're denied the ability to live in security in public and private spaces without danger. They're facing violence every day that goes unpunished. And it says, we are refused the right to be ourselves. We are denied the right to be women. We are women, and as women, we will never cease to claim our right to exist by and for ourselves. And I think, again, you know, you see always this clash between, you know, this amazing humanity versus really the barbarity of our times. The insane fatwa of this week is from the highest body of ulama in Indonesia and they have said that homosexuality should be punished by death. And it is this obsession with, you know, sexuality, people's bodies, again, anything that is normal, natural, 
loving, happy, they're against it. And these horrible people always pick on the section of society that they think they can win. You know, they, from their point of view, the weakest sort of group, so they could organize the rest of the society against them. But as you said, they're just crazy about sex, I mean, these guys. It's not that because they celebrate it or think it's something natural. That's the way they control it. So, I mean, that's what they do everywhere. And in Indonesia, this is what they've done. I it's, think this is, this it's, it reminds me of that joke of that comedian who said, you know, the suicide bombers are not really, they don't really have bombs on them. They're just exploding out of sexual frustration because they're just so obsessed with sex. And, you know, they hate it so much, in a sense, that they want to kill or abuse anyone who wants to just live, you know, normally and have sex, which is a very good and positive thing, actually. You know? yeah, but so one of the things that the uh, fatwa has said, this the head of the uh, fatwa commission, I mean, get another job, get a decent job, you know. <laughs> he, he's basically said that it's a disease that needs to be cured. And... Um, as a, to cure this disease, you need a series of brutal penalties ranging from caning to death. And I think this is this is shared with the Catholic Church. Can yeah. I, say? Mm -hmm. I think that's mm -hmm. you know in in, in Africa mm -hmm. we'll see that mm -hmm. and many many countries in in Africa and uh, the sources of it should be in. I think it comes from Vatican as well. And you'll see many mm -hmm. uh, you know Christian groups have the same idea about homosexuality. And and he, the, the, he said that you know. Uh, this is forbidden in Islam because it's a vile act that has to be punishable by the death penalty. And he says, it doesn't matter that they love each other. And they keep punishing people for various <laughs> things, and most of the punishment are by death. Yeah, they love death. Yes. Uh, like we've said many times on this program, Islam, like all religions, is a religion of death. They just want to kill. and But, you know, challenging that are, you know... Um, You've got gay rights groups in Indonesia saying we have a right to be gay and pushing back and fighting back in Tunisia and other places. And this is our movement, you know, people who are fighting back and uh, defending, you know, the very basic right to be gay, to be straight, to be whatever you want to be without the state's intervention and especially the ulamas and the fatwa commission's intervention. The good news of this week is a huge campaign internationally launched for justice for Farhonda, a young woman who was burned to death in Kabul in Afghanistan. And this is, although the whole news and the background to this is um, uh, shocking, so painful, this, painful yeah. but at the same time out of that, you know, a, a, a very progressive, very uh, just movement actually, which is focused on the right of women. Uh, is emerging in Afghanistan, mm -hmm. and it's important that everybody recognizes this, that uh, it, it's one of those moments that could affect Afghan society positively and uh, bring international support for right of women and critical thinking in Afghanistan, mm -hmm. which is very closely linked to the debate we've had today mm -hmm. regarding blasphemy. And I think one of the things too is that if you look at, um, you know, the aftermath of this heinous crime, you have, you know, Farhan, they've been given a burial with real respect. You have women. We're going to show photos of this because I think these photos are so beautiful, carrying her coffin um, to give her a burial. And um, you can see, you know, the, the sort of humanity that has come out in response to this really brutal act. And you've got this campaign where thousands of people in Afghanistan and elsewhere are saying that we are Farhonde, we demand justice, particularly when you think that the police were standing by while this was happening. And you've got clerics saying, you know, she, it was right what had happened to her. And the cleric actually said that, wanted to come to her burial, he was kicked out. Good. And that's yeah. uh, good news, and everybody's attacking that. Yeah. The other thing is that everybody's demanding, and has been demanding, uh, you know, that there is international condemnation of this. Yeah. You know, the board has a responsibility towards Afghanistan, and I think it's important to support this progressive element. We've seen uh, that international sort of community, so-called international community, it poured, you know, millions of dollars and pounds in support of uh, a coalition government between Taliban and various factions of the ruling class in Afghanistan, what we haven't seen is the support for the progressive section. Mm. And, and that's something that only we can organize and give that. And, people know, everywhere. And I think progressive movement internationally 
they need to, to support this. And this is a, it could be a brilliant moment in the history of mm -hmm. Afghanistan, I think. Uh, unfortunately, it's at the loss of, um, you know, a, a young woman's life. But in a sense, when we look at things that have changed, that have been, you know, the sort of spark it for happens, real yeah. fundamental changes sometimes in society, it's often been these sorts of cases. And this could really herald a change in Afghanistan, one which gives the women's rights campaigners, the secularists, the progressive movement in that country a real upper hand for a change. And I think it's definitely something we need to support. We need to demand justice and accountability, but also I think we need to be strongly against the execution of they the have perpetrators. Right. Some people have asked for uh, uh, capital punishment of those arrested, and I think we need to be very clear that that's not, uh, you know, human, human society shouldn't have capital punishment. It needs to be uh, people, these people should be on trial, needs to be investigated, the role of the religious they organizations, all have to be prosecuted, the yeah. role of the police who stood by and did nothing, and you know, and that needs to be investigated and proper, uh, brought to account properly, but no capital punishment. I think that's the, one of the strong messages from this program. Uh, we hope that you've enjoyed um, this week's program on blasphemy law and the interview we've had, um, and please do write to us. Uh, we welcome your comments and, and, uh, and support uh, for, the, for this program. And um, that's where and we, we've we also got a fundraising uh, campaign on Pan Patreon. We've got 12 lovely funders, and uh, we're looking for more people who can fund us on a weekly basis with just $1 a week. That's nothing. And, uh, you know, it really will help us uh, be able to develop our program and get some better equipment, which Reza Moradi is deeply in need of. And I think we should, we should also <laughs> uh, remind our viewers that we, because of the travelling that you have, we are... Not yet. No, no, no. <laughs> We'll tell you next week, don't. Yes. Let, pretend you didn't hear that. <laughs> okay, you're right. Okay, let's not... We let's hope you enjoyed this week's program and we'll see you again next week. Bye.